Remember that the initial rate of a reaction is the instantaneous rate at t equals zero. The slope of the line tangent to the concentration versus time curve at that t equals zero point. The great thing about initial rates is that we know exactly, at least in theory, what the concentrations of all the reactants are. They just are whatever they were when we set up the reaction before the reaction started, right? So what we can do then is use the initial rates in combination with these initial concentrations to figure out reaction orders, and that's the essence of what's called the method of initial rates, which we'll look at in this video. The idea behind a typical method of initial rates problem is to ultimately determine an order of reaction, a kinetic order, for one or more reactants in a chemical reaction. And to do this, we first of all run many different reactions with different initial concentrations and measure their initial rates. In the table of results then, we look for two experiments where only one concentration changes. The concentration of only one reactant changes across those two experiments. We then take the rate laws for those two runs of the reaction, those two experiments, and write a ratio of them. In that ratio, since all of the concentrations but one are controlled, all the concentrations will divide out except for the one we're interested in, and on the other side of the equation, as you'll see a bit later, we'll have a ratio of the initial rates, which will have been measured previously. We can then use logarithms and some pretty straightforward math to figure out the order of reaction for this reactant whose concentration changed. We can often repeat this for the other reactants, although this asterisk is meant to denote that sometimes this doesn't work. So let's look now at an example of applying the method of initial rates. Here we have a fairly beefy reaction with three different reactants and two different products involved. And we're going to measure the initial rate by looking at the initial formation of D at the very start of the reaction. There are three reactants, A, B, and C, and we look at the initial concentrations of all three of these in the middle columns of the table. And the left-hand column is just to denote the experiment number to make our lives a little bit easier in tracking the experiments. The first step in applying the method of initial rates is to look for two experiments where the concentration of only one reactant changes. So you want to look at commonalities throughout the table. If I look, for example, at the concentration of A column, I can see that in experiments one through three, that concentration is held constant. If I look at the B column, I see that in experiments one and three, that concentration is held constant. And if I look at the C column, I see that in none of these experiments is the concentration of C held constant. Since C is never held constant, it's probably a good idea to start there in terms of determining reaction order because we're not going to be able to find an experiment where the concentration of C is controlled. So I'm going to start there and look for two runs where the concentrations of both A and B remain constant. Based on our cursory glance through the table before, we can see that in experiments 1 and 3, we have 0.2 moles per liter for A and 0.1 mole per liter for B in both trials. And we, we can see that essentially the concentration of C triples in going from experiment one to experiment three. Notice what happens to the rates here. The initial rate for the formation of D doesn't change even though the concentration of C has changed. That should give you some intuition as to where we're going with the reaction order, but let's apply the method of initial rates pretty systematically here. The idea is to set up a ratio of the two. The initial rate for run three divided by the initial rate for run one on the left hand side and then on the right hand side we're going to put the rate laws. The rate constant times the concentration of A to some power, let's call it M, times the concentration of B to some power, let's call it N, times the concentration of C to some power, let's call it P, and this is all for trial three so these concentrations are going to be a little bit different divided by the corresponding expression for trial 1, the concentration of A in trial 1, the concentration of B in trial 1, and the concentration of C in trial 1, with C raised to the P power, B raised to the N power, and A raised to the M power. 
Now, we can start plugging in numbers, and one thing to realize right off the bat is since the concentration of A did not change across the runs, it will divide out. A to the M in trial 3 divided by A to the M in trial 1 is going to divide out to 1, since the molarity of A in trial 3 is equal to the molarity of A in trial 1. Likewise, for reactant B, the two concentrations are equal in trials 3 and 1, and so those are going to divide out. What we can do with the concentrations of C is group them together and kick the exponent. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. If I look at the concentration of C in trial 3, that's 0 0.30, 0 0.10 moles per liter in trial 1, and so we end up with 3 to the P. That's the right-hand side. That's fleshing out the right-hand side. Now let's flesh out the left-hand side. Rate 3 divided by rate 1. Well, those can simply be read right off the table. The initial rate for trial 3 is right here, and the initial rate for trial 1 is right here. The two are equal, so I won't even bother to write out the ratio. That ratio is simply equal to 1, and so we end up with 1 is equal to 3 to the p power. That tells us right away that p has to be equal to 0, right? The only exponent that makes 3 to the something equal to 1 is 0. So what we can say is that this reaction is zero order in C. The nice thing about this is it makes our lives a lot easier when we go to look at the additional reaction orders because we can now ignore the fact that the concentration of C is changing throughout all of these runs. The concentration of C does not impact the rate. That's what zero order behavior means. So we can essentially ignore what's going on in C when we go to find the orders of reactants A and B. So let's carry through this process and look now at experiments 1 and 2. We focus now on experiments 1 and 2. What we can see is that the concentration of A is held constant while the concentration of B triples across the runs. What happens to the initial rates? Well, evidently, when we triple the concentration of B in going from experiment 1 to experiment 2, the rate triples as well. We can express this mathematically by using this rate ratio the same way we did for experiments 1 and 3. So I'm going to skip a couple of steps here and just write the ratio of the two rates on the left-hand side. That's 6 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by 2 times 10 to the negative 4. That's equal to 3. Everything will cancel. The, the concentration of A raised to its order is going to cancel, and the rate constants will divide out as well. So we'll end up with a ratio of the two concentrations of B. That's 0 0.30 to 0. 100 moles per liter. I'll add my units in there since I'm being careful. And all of that's going to be raised to the n power where n is the order of b. Hopefully you can see from this that this ratio is simply 3. 3 equals 3 to the n power means that n is equal to 1 and what we can say about reactant b is that it is first order in this reaction. It has an order equal to 1. All that's left now is to figure out the order with respect to reactant A. And what we should notice is that the only trials where A changes are experiments 3 and 4. So we're going to have to use those, but the complicating factor here is that the concentration of B changes as well. Lucky for us, we already know the impact of B on the reaction rate. When the concentration of B triples, the reactant rate should triple. That's what first order behavior means, right? So what we can say is that the tripling of concentration B is going to cause this initial rate in trial 3 to become three times what it is in trial 3, essentially in going to trial 4, or 6.0 times 10 to the negative 4. And we can isolate the effect of reactant A as converting, if you will, or amplifying that rate from 6 times 10 to the negative 4 up to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 3. That's a factor of times 3. I'm running out of space here, but that times 3 is due to the impact of reactant A alone. And notice that the concentration of reactant A has also tripled here, which tells us ultimately that the reaction is first order in A as well. If this last bit is a little bit confusing, I would encourage you to go through this process systematically of writing out 
the ratio of the rate laws for trials 3 and 4, plugging in what you know from our previous work, namely that B is first order and C is zero order, and figuring out the order of A that way. That more systematic approach will show you how we arrived at first order for reactant A.